everybody. Thank you for the introduction, Melissa. It's kind of a, a pleasure to introduce today's topic because it's not mostly the result of my research, but three incredibly hardworking and gifted students, including Jonathan, who've done 90% of the work. So if you have any really big errors or problems with the analysis, you can direct it uh, to Jonathan and the students. Uh, but I thought I would also start with a quote, um, although it's probably not as good as the Schlesinger quote. That comes from Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who made a speech in the 1930s when justifying the New Deal. And he said something to the effect of, you can judge our country, or should judge our country, not based on what we give those who already have a lot, the few who have many, but uh, uh, how we deal with those who have so little, the many who have so few. Uh, and I think that's a really good way of framing what justice is really about, because as we'll see in Vermont, how we pay for energy is not an equitable issue. Or tend to pay more for the energy they use, even though they're using a lot less of it. And so that does present some kind of pressing concerns that we think deserve to be addressed as the state moves forward. I should also mention, and we do now and at the end, that this project has been funded by V. White, the Vermont Low Income Trust for Electricity. And so we're very thankful to them uh, for the funding needed to get this research done after a report that is set to come out next month. Tell me how to work with it. Thank you, Jonathan. So, to preview, all the presentations should have a preview of what we're going to talk about. I'm going to talk about why this issue of fuel poverty matters, how it differs from energy poverty. I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan, who's going to tell you a lot about our quantitative methods for the study, since he's our resident economist at the Institute for Energy Environment. Is that a clap? <laughs> like that. Yay for economists. Uh, He's going to talk about two sets of results, what's happening within the state of Vermont by a decile, uh, basically rich versus poor income decile, and it's also going to talk about some comparative results about where Vermont fits with the rest of New England, some surprising results there. I'll then step back in and talk about what recommendations we have, 12 recommendations, uh, four different sets of actors in Vermont, and then we'll finish hopefully right on time and open up the floor uh, for intensive questions and answers. How's this for a quote? This is from a study that's older than some of the students in this room. Uh, way back from the 1980s, after the oil supply shocks of the 1970s brought justice as a concern to the economics community, where they can say fuel poverty, this notion of what it is, is very difficult. It's not the same as poverty, because it relates to things like housing stock or living preferences, right? Things that extend beyond simply what you make. And so you'll see some really poor homes who are not fuel poor, because they happen to have inherited let's say, efficient infrastructure. And you'll also see on the flip side, rich people who live in houses that aren't very efficient. So this idea of fuel poverty is not static. It'll change based on income class or preferences or availability or prices. So how do we define this notion of fuel poverty? In our study, we take a definition from Oxford scholar, friend of Morgan, who has actually written three books on fuel poverty, including her latest one, Fixing Fuel Poverty which says basically a household is in fuel poverty if they spend 10% or more of their monthly income, post or pre-tax, you can differ based on how you calculate it, on energy needs. So it's not just electricity, uh, it's also things like heating, as well as sometimes you can include transport, although we don't include that in our study, having difficulty in tracking down some of the better. Why does it matter? As those who've taken my justice class know, it touches on three different aspects of justice at the same time. It touches on procedural justice, so issues of policy making, who gets to set electricity or gas tariffs and rates, how fair is that? Usually minorities, disenfranchised, aren't participating actively in those types of discussions, so it's not representative of their needs. It, issues of distributive justice, benefits and burdens of energy systems and how equitably they're distributed, it, usually it's not fair that most of the burdens fall on these poor households, even though they're consuming the least units of energy. And it's also justice as recognition uh, and marginalization, uh, since fuel poverty, at least in the US, is not usually something we see discussed about. In the same way we talk about security of supply, or shale gas, or climate change. So it's kind of a hidden topic that we prefer to ignore. You can see, though, that if you start to map things like household energy prices or consumption by decile, there is some significant inequality, where you can see here um, that up to 70%, and this, these are already out of date, it's actually higher now, up to 70% of the poorest homes in the UK suffer fuel poverty compared to what, about 1 or 2% 
of the entire upper to middle class. One of the other reasons this matters beyond just justice is, is quite simply death, um, perhaps the ultimate injustice. You can see here an epidemiological study that plots what are called excess winter deaths. These are unusual deaths that happen in the four or three, depending on how you define winter, coldest months of the year compared to the normal rates of mortality. And you can see here that roughly 278,000 deaths happen every year, about 80% of which are attributed to fuel poverty. The other 20% are attributed to things like evictions or homelessness um, or other attributes like changes in the price of food. But 80% economists have calculated relate purely to this idea of being fuel poor. So quite literally, it kills you. And if you take 80% of these numbers, you have an amount that is still greater than the number who died from climate change last year. If you believe the World Health Organization, they've calculated about 180,000 deaths are attributable to climate change every year. These numbers, 80%, is a little bit higher at above 200,000. To put that in perspective, for those here in Vermont, it's five times the size of Burlington. So it's really, really big, right? Um, given that Burlington is our, six and a half times, is our most populated city and state. It's not just death, though, that people suffering in fuel poverty have to confront. It's also a whole host of mental or physical disabilities and challenges. So um, it means people are living in cold environments, right, uh, which isn't good for their health. They have higher rates of strokes, heart attacks, other types of debilitating diseases. For children in these homes, they're missing school. Maybe they're getting made fun of. Or households have to make tough choices, like whether they pay the grocery bill or the energy bill. Uh, which results in, in pretty much suboptimal outcomes any way you look at it. Um, it also, because Vermont is so cold, means of these winter, excess winter deaths you see in the United States, something like 80% of them happen in the Northeast. Um, and so this is also kind of a problem that is more pegged to where we live here in New England. And with that optimistic news, I thought I would turn the floor over to Jonathan, who's going to tell you more about the prevalence and scope of energy and fuel poverty in the state of Vermont. Yep, go get them. Um, and I just want to say, if you have a clarifying question, please feel free to raise your hand in the middle, um, rather than trying to hold it to the end. Um, so I think, you know, these are uh, some background on how we did the study. Uh, so the survey size is pretty good. Um, there'll be some addendum to that uh, as we go forward. So we're talking about deciles. This is, will give you a sense of what the deciles look like in Vermont. Um, all dollar values that you see throughout this presentation have been adjusted for inflation to 2013 dollar values. And these are the cutoffs. Uh, you know, that show the lines between which 10% of the population counted as households are in Vermont recently. Um, there's some very, you know, deep poverty. These are pre pre tax numbers? These are pre tax numbers. I'm going to show you what, the cal how, what, the, what we mean by income on the next slide. Um, and of course, just as a reminder, because these are the cutoffs and they're drawn as, you know, for example, first, the poorest decile below 14.2, the average for those households is going to be less than that. This is annual income, and I guess it's in two slides. Um, maybe I'll start with it. Okay, here is our, here is, this is borrowed from the survey, uh, which is done by the Census Bureau. Um, this is what we mean when here when we're talking about income. So, uh, so it includes income that you get from the government, benefits, you know, that came out of the tax flow, uh, but it is not does not subtract the spending on taxes. And going back, so we are going to be uh, they're looking at. The three, these three factors that are going to tell you whether or not a household ends up being in fuel poverty. Um, they're buying energy. It has a price. You multiply that by how much they buy. You find out how much they're spending. You take that spending, what fraction of their total income are they spending on energy? 
that gives you their energy burden, what we're calling their energy burden. Which the word burden sort of sounds bad already, but if it's small, you might not feel like a burden. But if, it, if it's high, we get this 10% threshold, we call it fuel poverty. Uh, and, and Benjamin talked about it it's certainly correlates with what we traditionally think of as poverty, this financial poverty, but depending on the housing stock and things like that, uh, it, it, you know, it's not a perfect match. Um, so let's look at the prices, factor number one. This shows how prices of the primary heating uh, and you know, the, the, the forms of energy in the household, again, we're ignoring transportation, what's happened to them over the time period uh, being analyzed, being studied. Electricity, remarkably stable, highly regulated. Um, this is Vermont, it's not true <coughs> in every place. Uh, and the others, as you can see, you know, are going up. Now this does not mean that natural gas and propane have almost have a similar price. Um, it's just started, where, wherever it was that they started, they've gone up by similar percentages. Uh, per BTU of heat that you can get out of it, natural gas is less expensive. Um, now, you know, rising prices can be a problem, but they won't be a problem if, uh, if you reduce the amount of energy that you're using, um, or if your income is going up as faster, faster, then your burden will not be increasing. So let's see about the quantities. This is, um, you can see here the deciles, the first column, the average kilowatt hours used by these households in a year within each decile. Uh, big, you know, pretty big difference, maybe not surprising. Um, and what's been happening uh, over this, you know, 12 year time span with their consumption of electricity. Not big changes. Uh, it is interesting that the changes, there is a sort of a, a real difference between the top half and the bottom half. Um, one has a negative sign, one has a plus sign in terms of what they've been doing, but it, 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 it is not, they're not orders of magnitude different from each other. I, I am, I, I can't answer the question with the information available, but it is curious to me, you know, the, the lowest deciles, the poorest, have been increasing their use of electricity the most rapidly. Again, not in huge numbers, but um, as a percentage rate. Why is that? You know, is there culturally this proliferation of electronic devices and they're keeping up with the Joneses? Is it that as those other fuels that are primarily for heating, uh, oil and propane and natural gas are becoming more expensive. Lower income households are using more, you know, room, electric room heaters uh, as a way to balance their cost of energy. I, I don't know the answer. Um, here's natural gas, which in Vermont is available only in the Northwest, in the Burlington area. Um, so, and the, this is only looking at those households that used natural gas and paid for it, and got a bill for it. Uh, you can see, you know, almost across the board, there have been mild reductions on average over time in their use um, of a similar order of magnitude, minus 1% for the top half, minus half a percent for the bottom half. Um, it could easily be a statistical, just the accident statistics that makes it look different. I've added another column at the on the right-hand side, which shows what's been happening with the winters. There, there has been a trend over these 12 years, whether or not it's global warming. Though these particular 12 years have had a trend of milder winters, measured as fewer heating degree days. HDD are the heating degree days. Uh, and these are measured in Burlington. And the trend has been, it bounces around a little bit, but it, it, there is a trend. Um, and it's been down by about 1% a year. So, the fact that the fuel reduction has been going down by a similar magnitude as the severity of the winters makes me wonder, you know, how, how much does the temperature, does the climate simply explain that change in behavior? 
maybe there's been, you know, the, the price increase was four and a half percent. The drop, I'm not sure how that plays out. Um, maybe there hasn't been much efficiency gain. Maybe those increases in natural gas price have not triggered people to change their behaviors or put in more insulation so much. Maybe it's just an, maybe it's just an artifact of the weather. Obviously, some weatherization has been going on, so it, it's not strictly weather. And going on to heating oil and propane, um, uh, which I you know, turned it into a, a weighted average. Here you see more significant reductions, uh, minus 2% per year as an average change, which is faster than the weather is changing. And the, yes? Um, curious about whether some of these numbers might be explained by increased uh, usage of wood. Possibly. I'm going to look at fuel switching uh, in a moment. Um, uh, and, you know, you can see 7.7% as the average increase in price. Natural gas is 4.5%. So it may not be surprising that people are reacting more strongly to oil and propane and, and trying to reduce their use of those. Um, okay. So here we get a look at what, what is the primary source of heating fuel in the household. This is across you know, the whole state, all the deciles, um, over the time period. A very clear reduction in the use of heating oil and a very clear increase in the reliance on wood. This is their, the primary source of heating. So if a, a household switches from fuel oil to wood, it doesn't mean they've necessarily stopped using oil. It might have been at the beginning of the time period, they did 60% of their heat came from oil and 40% from wood. So then oil would be their primary. And at the end, they were just being a little more assiduous about you know, building up the, the, the wood stove more often. So then it's 60% wood, 40% oil. And then, they, then in this statistic, they would have switched colors. Um, uh, so next, I wanted to know, well, who has been doing the switching? And this uh, might be a little bit sort of awkward to look at. The black bars pointing towards the left show how much people are getting out of oil. So the, the, the more to the left that bar goes, those households are using less and less oil, or are less commonly using oil as their primary heating fuel. And the red bars to the right show a movement into wood as a primary heat fuel. And it's not perfectly symmetrical in everything, but uh, there seems to be a clear advantage. The, the higher income households have been able to do more fuel switching. Um, one obvious explanation for that advantage uh, is renter versus ownership. Uh, there's also a question of capital cost up front. It's, it's even if you have the legal right to just choose what your heating system is, um, it, it can be expensive to make the change. So here are the stats on who's renting, who's not renting. Um, I was, I'm struck by sort of this big drop from the fifth to the sixth. You know, it's all of a sudden you drop 14 percentage points. Uh, you know, it, it's as if, you know, real bottom half and the top half. A uh, real big change in, in that particular aspect of, of living, but you know, half of half of the half of the people who are poor have very little ability to, to switch fuel even if they want to, other than maybe moving to a different apartment. Okay, so we have the prices, we've got the quantities. You can switch fuels. What happens? What what is it for spending? What are people actually paying in the end? And this is showing over. You know, 2012 compared to 2000, the increase in spending on all household energy, electricity, heating oil, propane, natural gas, wood, coal, coke, solar, except that you don't have to pay for solar, except when you buy the equipment. Um, uh, again, ignoring transportation. So big increases in spending. Once again, if everyone's incomes are going up, then we could be hunky-dory, be no problem. And you won't be surprised to know that incomes have not been going up. 
This is, you know, that's been this, the, the story of kind of some of the politics of the last decade. Uh, really, really stacked, except for the very top. Um, and, you know, because of the way the drawing line, you can't see the first decile, you know, ever so slightly, that trend line does point very slightly down. Again, these are all converted inflation adjusted to 2013 dollars. So that means there's going to be burdens, growing burdens. Um, and let's look. So looking at electricity alone, and let me explain how these graphs are done, it's the percentage of income that is remaining after you have spent your money on the form of energy. So if you're up high, that means you have a lot of leftover money. If you're down low, you have less money left over. Energy ate up a lot of your income. If you're in the gray area below the 90% line, you're in fuel poverty. So electricity by itself, even though it's rarely used as a heating fuel, you know, where you know really you use it up real fast, electricity by itself is enough to put the bottom decile of households in Vermont into fuel poverty. It's not getting worse. As we saw, the price of electricity has held very stable, and the quantities have changed only marginally. Um, uh, and you know, for the other households too, they're just everything's about the same. Natural gas for those households using natural gas uh, is not surprising. Prices are going up, quantities aren't changing very much, incomes aren't changing very much, so it's been getting more and more of a burden. To, to use that natural gas. We go on to other fuels, which is, in the survey, it's anything else. Heating oil, propane, wood are the, the main ones uh, in Vermont. Um, and it's, you see these slope, they're even steeper. They're more rapidly uh, becoming increasing burdens. And it's really, you know, I mean, just, just, just the heating oil, this is without the electricity, 20% um, roughly of uh, money, of income going to the heating oil, propane, or whatever, for the bottom dust oil. And then we put them all together, all spending on household energy. Um, and and it, it doesn't, it's, it's not a good situation. The bottom three deciles, roughly the bottom third, of uh, Vermont households are in fuel poverty as of 2012. Uh, and the trend is, you know, it's a, been a clear trend. Um, we can project forward, you know, if these trends hold, who knows? Uh, here's 10 years worth of projections. At this trend, the fourth decile enters technical fuel poverty as we've defined it in 2029. Um, so, here's a comparison. Benjamin showed that graph at the beginning of, of how fuel poverty is distributed across the population in the UK. Here it is for Vermont in 2012. And again, you can be really, you can be dirt poor, you can be in that first decile, and maybe not be in fuel poverty. Um, and, it, you know, by golly, there was a household in 2012, in the 10th decile, I looked at them, they made over $130,000 a year, they reported, and they spend $15,000 a year on energy. Um, I think it's funny, there's, I think there's a business in the home and they have 14 bedrooms, maybe it's a bed and breakfast, I don't know what's going on. It's obviously an oddball outlier, but they buy a lot of energy, so, you know, that's, it, it, it's, it, presumably it's an issue. It's the grow lights. Huh? It could be the grow lights. It could be the grow lights. Absolutely. So, uh, as best we can, I wanted to take a look at how it differentiates around the state. Um, the data we have allows us to get this narrow uh, into these quadrants. The Census Bureau refers to them as PUMAs, Public Use Microdata Areas. Um, and so here we go. So the first question is, are incomes different? Because if you, you know, if fuel poverty is going to be different in different places, maybe it's because in some places people are poorer. And I was quite surprised to see, I hope this is visible, the black on the red is, is a little hard. Um, there's not really much difference. So it's, you know, in the first decile, Northwest, 94%, what that says is the average income 
for the poorest decile households in the Northwest, that Burlington area, is 94% of the average for the first decile for the whole state. How does this area's poor households compare to poor households across the state? And it's not a huge difference. There are two that kind of stand out. The, the poorest decile in the Southwest and the richest decile in the Southwest. And you got me why. These could be statistical clues. We're starting to get to fairly small numbers of households because we took that, we started with 2,000, 3,000 households being surveyed. Now we've cut them into, we've reduced them to quarters, you know, because they put the state into quarters. And then we divided by 10 because we put them into deciles. So some of these subgroups, you know, might, the survey might have only cut, include 30, 35 households. And that's going to make your statistics uh, a little iffy. So this is just rough numbers. Don't take any of these numbers as gospel. Um, there is a big difference in what kind of fuels are being used. That big white box is natural gas, and which the Northwest has, and they use it. Um, the fact that some households even reported natural gas, any, in the other quadrants, when there is no natural gas utility service in those territories, I suspect that's uh, survey error. You know, maybe they, they use propane and they just, they call it gas. So when they were answering the survey, they said, yeah, we use gas. I don't know exactly. Um, it's not physically impossible, but it's really unlikely that they're using natural gas. The other thing that I see that's, you know, uh, there's a lot more heating oil in the southwest. And the two east, the eastern half of the state, the two middle bars, uh, clearly are using more wood as the primary heating source. It doesn't mean that they're only heating source in the household, but it's the primary. Um, okay, so how do the burdens look? Electricity alone. Uh, the pattern that I see is the Northwest has an advantage. It doesn't mean that they're not in fuel poverty, it doesn't mean that it's not a burden, but relatively speaking, the Northwest has an advantage over the rest of the state. In, in each and every decile, it appears. Um, it's Burlington Electric, they have tiered rates. GMP has a single flat rate. Does that tier help? I, I, you know, I'm not sure what it is. Or maybe just less electric use. Maybe, you know, so many apartments in the city and something. I don't know. Um, we go to the other fuels. I'm skipping natural gas because only the Northwest has natural gas. Uh, other fuels, again, uh, the, the Northwest, except the fourth decile, you know, really similar, but pretty much the Northwest seems to have at least a slight advantage. Uh, you put it all together for all household energy. Again, the Northwest has the advantage. You can see that their advantage is pretty big because now we're seeing how nat the influence of natural gas, um, and you know, which is one of the arguments for extending the gas pipeline down in Madison County or anything. Um, it is less expensive uh, as a source of BTUs. Um, uh, whether or not it's justice, once you include climate impacts and fracking and everything, you know, it's, it's quite complicated, but there you have it. Uh, and the other thing that starts to look like a pattern here when you have all energy included is that the eastern states, the, two, the red and blue, the eastern half of the state, seems to have a tendency to have greater burdens. Um, you know, that's possible. And then, here is, we'll go and look at the region, looking at the poorest households alone. You can see that Vermont, it, I mean, it's miserable, between you know 26 and 29% of an energy burden, severe fuel poverty, some small consolation prize. We're not Connecticut, Maine, New York, or Rhode Island. Um, uh, uh, for that's for the, the poorest households alone. If you broaden the view, you know, because there's not a lot of money in the second half, the second decile, third decile, you go to the first to third combined, I, you know, I don't know why it would be exactly quite, quite different, but everyone's doing badly, um, and Vermont joins the bulk of the Northeast with, relatively speaking, you know, tied for, for being in the worst situation. And, 
that's it for the statistical analysis. Uh, the question is next, you know, what do we do? How can we fix it? Thank you, John. I've got six minutes left. My wife told me to speak slowly. That's right. So I won't be able to get through all of it. I'll try to go quickly. One of the reasons when we started our recommendations, we looked at the UK, is because they've had the world's longest existing fuel poverty program for a decade and a half. It started in 2000, 2001, called Warm Fund. Um, and they put in billions and billions of pounds into this program and impacted, I think, two and a half million households. Right? So it's a massive scale program that we look to to see is there an example there that we can learn from. And they had Warm Front, Warm Front Plus, they had special programs for, for elderly people and pregnant people, et cetera. Um, but even that massive program, which basically gave rebates to upgrade grants to help upgrade the cost of uh, more efficient insulation or draft proofing, et cetera, even in the UK, it didn't really work. It worked until around here, and then fuel poverty in both vulnerable households and overall households has increased. And now they're projecting by 2015, 2016, half of British households will be in fuel poverty. So it's mostly getting worse because around this time they also restructured their electricity and gas sectors to make them more competitive and passed more costs onto consumers, which means the burdens have increased. There were also some really well done audits of the Warm Front program that found it was reaching roughly only one third of households it should have been reaching. Two thirds either weren't fuel poor or fuel poor houses didn't enroll into the program. For a variety of reasons that the National Audit Office puts here, many of which is just homes didn't elect to nominate themselves as eligible for the program because they didn't know they were fuel poor or they were ashamed of being fuel poor. In the United States, we have two major programs, LIHEAP and the Weatherization Program, but these also have their issues, one of which is they're tragically underfunded. Uh, and you can see here, if you actually look at weatherization spending per capita, Vermont, it, it, it's, I think, what, it's 20 to $30 per person. Right? So it's not spending large amounts of money. I mean, that's a worthy burger meal, um, and that's it. And so obviously there are some issues with how we've tried to deal nationally with fuel poverty in the US. Um, it's also important to make this distinction. Many people presume that when you change energy prices, if you increase them at all, you increase the burden, but that's not always the case as this shows, because sometimes if you increase prices, people become so much more efficient, the burden is actually less. And so energy efficiency can raise rates, but lower prices. So there's a very complicated relationship sometimes that exists between prices and consumption. So our recommendations are a little bit different. We haven't focused exclusively on price. We haven't focused exclusively on weatherization or on rebates like the Warm Front program and grants. Instead, we've got 12 recommendations, three for each of these four sets of actors. So we have three for the Vermont legislature. This is a photo of the legislature, for those of you that don't know Montpelier. Uh, three for state <coughs> agencies, like the Agency of Human Services. Three for social groups, like Renewable Energy Vermont. And then three for fuel providers, like Irving Energy, or some of the others that, that sell oil or propane or others in the state. So what are the three recommendations for the legislature? The first is that we have to go beyond the weatherization assistance program. Uh, estimates by economists have suggested that every dollar invested yields you know, $2.51 back to society. So these investments make sense in terms of improved efficiency and lower future bills. Yet the program is chronically underfunded. So we should try to get our senators and legislature to get more money going into weatherization, whether that's just a grant or it's a surcharge or we revenue, we put some of the systems benefits charge, the BEIC manages into it, remains to be seen, but they need more money. As one of our interviewees, so we did interviews uh, with stakeholders in Vermont, quoted, it's simply a matter of price. We just need more money. That's the single most important way Vermont can better handle fuel poverty. They could also do things like improve LIHEAP, right? The Central Vermont Community Action Council claims there's a waiting list of 18 months for people who need weatherization assistance. That's older than my justice class, right? Which is just old. So it's not the best analogy, but you get the idea. 18 months is a long time when winter is coming. You know, anyone who watches Game of Thrones? Uh, anyway, winter is right <laughs> around the corner here in Vermont all the time. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Also, we've, uh, 
state policymakers have talked about a labeling scheme for homes, right? We have labeling for cars and for appliances, but not always for homes. So here's a sample of uh, what the Vermont Home Energy Score could look like, where you could see monthly energy bills, you could see where the home falls in its score compared to other homes of a similar class or of a similar neighborhood. And so they've been playing around with this idea, but they haven't yet, Efficiency Vermont hasn't yet implemented a final label for homes. What recommendations for state agencies? One is we think they should begin to endorse more cold source heat pumps, uh, which is a new technology that wasn't really available commercially 10 to 15 years ago. Um, you can see here, cold climate heat pumps, there's a little fact sheet that's available from the Department of Energy that explains how they work and how they could work in places like Vermont. Also, we think that we should do more work on multifamily housing units, especially since, as Jonathan showed, roughly half of the lowest decile doesn't own their home or their renting property, which creates some pretty significant split incentives within investing or upgrading their efficiency. And then, because electricity has been more regulated and has had at least slightly more stable prices, we may want to reconsider the role of electric heat. I remember when I moved to Vermont a few years ago for the first time, I asked, because I'm from Ohio, we have an electric heating system. Should I get an electric heating system? And everyone said, no, of course not. It's too cold in Vermont. You need the strength of liquid oil, right? That's literally what my real estate agent said, right? And so there may be a stigma against electric heating, but uh, Kevin? I, mean, um, I guess I'm kind of confused by this a little bit. You're really endorsing the most efficient electric heating technology by the heat pumps. Right. So why, you know, I mean, it's not just do electric heat pumps, it's also get them entirely off things like wood or oil or other fuels. So the one up top is introduce heat pumps as eligible for some of the things that the state does. The bottom one is actually promote the complete electrification of heat in some of those homes. It's not one of my ideas, but it is I what some of our stakeholders have I, suggested. Yeah, I, I would think about that because I'm not sure that the economics of that really work, especially you know, in terms of um, you know, it may not work, right. um, and you know, wood, wood. we have some recommendations for pelletized wood and the way it's distributed as well in the report. But I, I our stakeholders that we when I think interviewed not more than one suggested right. electric heat. So it is something that keeps coming up. So, and I know Jonathan has some views on it as well. Maybe we can let him talk about it in the question and answer session, which I need to get to very, very soon. Um, but it's a good point. Maybe my real estate agent was right. It should have been wood or oil or one of the reasons. But we should at least consider, it says consider electric heat, not do it. For social service agencies, we think that we should start doing more energy efficiency coaching. And so this is actually a real photo published by Efficiency Vermont last year of a woman who is so happy she got coached on how to use energy more efficiently. Look at that smile. I haven't seen anyone smile like that in Vermont law school for, you know, for a long time. Uh, also, disseminate more energy conservation kits. This is actually a photo of an energy conservation kit distributed by TVA. I couldn't find one uh, in Vermont. But it's basically a collection of material, LED bulbs, CFLs, and instructions about how you can improve energy use in the home. It's not quite as strenuous as an energy audit, but it's also a lot cheaper. These kits usually cost $30 to $50, and TVA at least funds theirs, Tennessee Valley Authority, um, on a rate charge to other consumers, so it doesn't come out of tax revenue. And we think better promote education and awareness somehow, whether it's through videos or traditional printed materials, because many people don't realize they may be in fuel poverty and or that they're eligible for LIED, for WMP, and other programs. Finally, for utilities and fuel providers, this is probably the <coughs> most difficult recommendation, because a lot of these fuel providers have been, it's been suggested that they switch some of their service practices for a decade now, and they resist this because their idea is they don't want to diversify. But one of them is that we could um, start arranging for social service agencies to be put in touch automatically with customers when they're about to be disconnected. So Vermont law does say you have to give them warning. So rather than just giving them the warning, you provide a link or a website that helps them sign up for some of the assistance that the state offers that currently doesn't happen. You could utilize on-mill financing for improvements. Uh, this is what the city of Berkeley did with this thing called FIRST. It wasn't part of their energy bills. They made it part of property taxes. So there was a levy on each year's property tax, and that levy helped fund the upgrade to the house. The idea was if you sold the house, then it passed on to the future person who would conceivably benefit uh, from the upgrade. So you could do something similar here as part of monthly bills uh, to kind of force consumers 
or at least enable them to finance upgrades they may not be able to afford now. And then finally, this is the one that was controversial, help them shift, help Irving Energy shift from just selling oil to doing other things, to providing energy services, right? So the focus isn't on oil or gas, it's on affordable heat or warmth. And so it shifts the focus so that they now don't take a technology-centered approach to what they're doing, but a services-centered approach. And that's our talk. So here are all the sources that, that Jonathan and the team have used to put together a lot of the nice graphs and charts that you've seen. Uh, and we appreciate your time. All questions, we're still revising the report. So if you don't put your question in now in the next 10 minutes, email Jonathan in the next week and we'll try to include your feedback as, as we draft the final report and go forward. And with that, I guess I'll turn the floor back to Melissa. Actually, you can just, just handle call the on people as yeah. you Yes, hi. Hi, uh, my name is Scott Woodward. I live in uh, Vermont Law Grad and, and live in the area. Uh, I, I, having been here now for five years and being a New England native, the whole wood burning phenomena is, is interesting because I wonder from a data perspective, there's this undertone to the data, I think that, and the, and the question is why is today heating wood, uh, firewood is so expensive? Because there is a, uh, it, it, it's pricey for someone to go out and buy a cord of wood. Uh, and so it makes me think that they're in the, in the decile, uh, it's not even an option for some people to buy firewood even if they have the facilities to do it. Because firewood, it's hard to make that switch because firewood is expensive. And, and whether that's a good idea or not, I, I'm not sure. But, but I guess the, the question is, some energy sources are out of out of reach to some people uh, because of the cost, and I'd be curious if you have any insight as to whether uh, why even firewood is expensive. Um, there's two things. One is my understanding is that on a BTU basis, on the actual heat that you get out of it, wood is still cord wood, also pellets are less expensive certainly than the fossil fuels. Um, I won't swear about natural gas, but certainly heat and oil and propane. Doesn't make it cheap, it just relatively speaking. One other thing too is some of the poorest households that I've met actually chop their own wood. Yeah. So they don't pay at all. Well, they pay for it, but only with the infrastructure right. chopping yeah. it down all yeah. that sort of stuff. The other interesting thing is there's also a luxurious use of wood. Too. Right. So if you saw Jonathan's slide where who's doing the switch to wood, it's because a lot of these bed and breakfasts love the sound and the look and the warmth it gets. And so they're switching not because of cost, but because of convenience or comfort or luxury and other aspects. So it's a kind of it's kind of ironic we're returning back to where we came from. You know, the wood was the fuel that we used, you know, through the Middle Ages to keep warm and yeah. coming back to it in some ways. There is the ANR um, does a very small, <laughs> super unscientific survey of wood prices. It only goes back a few years. Mm -hmm. So it's something that I uh, for those few years that they have data points, they're talking about a quart of green wood. Those prices haven't been changing, but it's a super unscientific survey. That it's an open question: what has been happening to wood prices? Uh, and I think it, it's a question that would be helpful to answer. Yeah, I, I hail from the <clears throat> sunny, warm part of the world, Los Angeles, California, and it's on a panel involving energy development, solar and wind in the Mojave Desert. And an attorney for an environmental group made the point that she was very disappointed that we were dedicating large portions of our desert, converting them, of course, to these um, large energy, energy facilities, even if they were um, renewables, when the homes in California were so poorly designed and uh, from a weatherization standpoint. So I was wondering, the question is, is there a component of what you're doing in which as Vermont moves to more renewable forms of energy, you can tie the move to renewable forms to also improve efficiency in houses. I mean, one Which, of course, brings the energy use down a little bit. Yeah, one thing that we certainly heard from in the stakeholder interviews, especially with you know, the most efficient uh, and probably cost-effective source of heat, other than chopping your own wood, if you have access to a wood lot, um, nowadays is these cold climate heat pumps. Um, uh, but, I mean, you know, they're expensive, and, it, you know, you, you don't want to put, you don't want to put one on a house that's a sieve, 
where all that heat is just going right back out. You know, it is really, really important to get a house insulated and airtight, you know, relatively speaking, before you, you know, before you start also investing money in the fuel switching and something like that. Um, so they, they certainly go hand in hand. You know, there's, there's so much efficiency gains that we need. At the same time, there, you know, there's this, you know, gigantic energy infrastructure that we also have to change. And sometimes with the limited funds, you know, there's going to be a scramble for priorities. Um, efficiency still is a more, uh, you know, per dollar invested in efficiency, you're getting more bang for your buck, you know, on, on carbon emissions reductions and things like that than, um, than most any investment in the renewables. But we do need the renewables. One other interesting way that the situation could become much more complicated is in a future in which we electrify transport, vehicle to grid, electric vehicles that are at least recharging at night, that could also have some synergies with fuel poverty because now your car can become a source of income rather than just a burden. And so transportation could actually become that positive in some ways if you're one of the first to provide ancillary services to the grid or other things. And so that's something else that maybe 10 or 15 years out, as these new automotive technologies are perfected, there could be a way to kind of involve transportation in a mutually beneficial way for poor households, uh, which would also enhance the ability to store renewables and other intermittent sources. We have time for one more question, Murad. Uh, yeah, thanks for the explanation on fuel poverty. I, I think they did a good job showing one uh, side of the equation, which is poor households uh, really take a lot of burden. But you also had the other part of the equation where some of the richer households may be fuel poor. So I'm wondering probably the question is about the color line in the model. Um, well, well, which did yes, I was. Oh, uh, you repeat the question, I suppose. Well, I, I knew that, you know, three months ago. Could you repeat the question? I, Could you repeat the question? Where, where is the poverty line? line? Oh, what is so, line you know, line. relative to the deciles? And three months ago, I knew the answer. I thought it was bottom three. But I might be roughly, wrong. roughly, it's roughly bottom three. three. That's what I recall. Um, so, but again, you know, but again, you know, you can be above the poverty line, uh, and you might be spending, you know, if you have a poorly insulated house, you might be spending so much money that it's really hindering your ability to buy enough food, do, you know, do the other things that you need. Um, so it is this not exactly the same as poverty. Does that answer okay? Yeah. I'll yeah. Thank you for your questions. I think I'm getting evil stares from others in the audience that we should end the discussion now that it's four minutes to one. So thank you very much. For